Um, so thank you so much for having me, Lul Ventures. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here. It's a pleasure to, to, to speak with you today. Um, today we're going to really be focusing on habit-forming technologies and how to create high engagement products. You know, if there's one thing we know about technology over the past few years is how profoundly it changes our behavior. I'm sure you've all noticed this in your day-to-day -day life, how your habits have been altered from the products that we use every single day. Now, these companies that we think of when we think about habit-forming technologies tend to have the same common pattern time and time again. And let me, let me see if any of these patterns bring to mind any companies for you. They start off as a toy. They're typically underestimated. And yet, within a few years' time, these products are touching hundreds of millions of people and many of them making hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars. What companies come to mind when I give that description? Twitter. Twitter, great example. Just had a huge IPO. I remember a few years ago in the Valley, people were talking about Twitter like it was just some big joke. Why would I want to tweet every time I eat my lunch? What else? Facebook. Facebook. There, there's the biggest one, I think, of them all, right? The $130 billion toy that's now touching one in every eight people on the planet. What else? Instagram. Instagram, 12 people, 18 months, $1 billion. What else? Pinterest. Pinterest, another great example. They're doing very, very well. I think they're well over 20 million users now, doing incredibly well. Again, they look like toys, underestimated, and then suddenly they're profoundly changing our day-to-day -day habits. So what I've done over the past two and a half years is to collect patterns that underlie these companies. What is it about these companies that are typically underestimated, start out as toys, start out as nice to haves, and within a few short years are changing our day-to-day -day routines and our day-to-day -day lives? I compiled my learning into this book that just came out actually the first of the year called Hooked, and I'm gonna share a very, very, very high level overview of the book with you because we only have about an hour or so uh, to give you kind of a taste of, of what my research concluded. Uh, I also teach this course as part of a, a class at the Stanford Graduate School of Business and the Design School. And just as a word of warning, the class is a three-week class. There's lots to the class. I'm going to compress it all down to about an hour. So it's going to be a little fast. It's OK. It's just a taste, hopefully. So when I started my research, I asked myself the same question that investors had asked me when I was starting my last company. I would constantly get asked this question of, is your product a vitamin or a painkiller? And maybe you were asked this too when you were raising your funds. Um, investors would constantly ask this because investors want to invest in painkillers, right? Products that customers can tell you they need. Stop my pain. Oops, something's wrong with the clicker. I'm sorry. That have quantifiable markets. Customers can tell us their pain. It's about stopping that need, addressing that problem immediately. Now, vitamins are a different story. If an investor asks you, is your product a vitamin or a painkiller, and you tell them, yeah, it's a vitamin, you usually get dinged, right? They typically don't invest in your company. Because vitamins, you know, we don't really need them. They're nice to have. We don't know if that vitamin we take every morning is actually making us healthier. But it feels good knowing that we're trying to do something about our health. It's not about efficacy. It's about emotion. So here's my question. These companies that we just talked about, that I just solicited the names of from you, from you all. These companies that change our day-to-day -day behaviors, our change day-to-day -day habits, what are they? Are they vitamins or are they painkillers? How many of you think they're vitamins? Okay, a little more than, yeah, almost everybody. What about painkillers? Who's the, who thinks they're painkillers? Okay, a few folks. Well, before you make up your mind, let me posit this thought. That a habit is when not doing something causes a bit of pain. A habit is when not doing something causes a bit of pain because what we find is endemic to habit-forming technologies is that they start out as vitamins, they start out as pleasure-seeking behaviors, and they become painkillers. <coughs> right? These companies identify the need and provide the remedy. Over time, users originally come to the product seeking pleasure, seeking something, an enjoyable solution, as a toy in many cases. But then as the dependency builds, as the habit is formed, it becomes a must-have. It becomes something that they need in their day-to-day -day lives. But let me just address for a moment what I mean exactly by pain. This isn't the kind of pain I'm talking about. We're not talking about physical pain. 
If, if you'll indulge me for a moment, if you can close your eyes for just a second, I want to do a little mind experiment with you. So close your eyes. And I want you to imagine for just a minute that you have received a message. In whatever medium it is that you use when someone important needs to contact you. Maybe it's an email, maybe it's an SMS, maybe it's a WhatsApp message, whatever it is that you use when someone important needs to reach you. I want you to think about it, blinking at you, waiting for you. And I want you to bring awareness to how your body feels right now. Think about the feeling your body is experiencing in experiences and give that feeling a name. Right? What does that feel like to you right now? Now, once you have that name in your head of what you're experiencing, open your eyes and just shout it out. What are you feeling just now? Urge. An urge? Uncomfortable. Uncomfortable. What else? Curiosity. Curiosity. What else? Nudged. Nudged. Okay. What else? Excitement. Excitement. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. Anybody feel a bit of tension here in the solar plexus? A little bit of shortness of breath. A lot of people report that. I see a few nodding heads. So what you felt just now is what I call the itch. It's not quite pain, but it's a discomfort. People will register with this ex exercise, they'll say anxiety, a bit of stress, curiosity, some kind of itch, some kind of urge to check, an impulse. And it turns out that what we use as the solution to our discomfort is what we come to associate with, right? What we come to associate these habits that influence our day-to-day -day lives. So just to be clear here, what we are not doing is creating addiction. Addiction has a very specific definition, which we are not, and this isn't a class on how to teach you how to create addictions, because addictions are always bad. Addictions always harm the addict, right? However, Facebook isn't an addiction? So hold on a second. <laughs> However, there are the same neural pathways the same biochemistry, the same process that forms addictions can form something that's either good or bad, whereas addictions are always negative. And those are habits. Habits can be good or bad. We can have good habits, we can have bad habits. And I believe that we're on the precipice of an age where we can use technology to help people form habits to improve their lives. And in fact, I'm not the only one. There's a whole host of companies today Many of them are in Silicon Valley, some of them are here in Israel, all over the world. Companies that are using habit creation techniques to help people live healthier, happier, more connected, richer lives. And so that's what I want to help you do. To answer your question, some people can use Facebook as an addiction, some people can use Facebook as a habit. Now for many people, for most people I believe, it's a healthy habit. It's a way to connect with people in their lives. However, some people take it too far and they harm themselves. So the same product in some cases can actually create addictions. And I think there's a whole other discussion about what companies' responsibilities are once they know they're creating addictions. But we're going to save that for another talk. But thank you for the question. So we know that habits can actually really help people's lives. Right? There's a whole host of companies trying to change users' habits to improve their lives, to make their lives better. And that really should be our goal. How do we create healthy habits using technology? So it turns out that there's only two things that you need to create a habit. It's actually quite simple. Two things. There's an Oxford study conducted last year that concluded that the first thing that's required to form a habit is that the behavior occur frequently. So in this study, they tried to get people to form the habit of flossing their teeth. It turns out that over 60% of people don't floss their teeth every night. If you don't floss, highly recommend it. It's actually more important than brushing is flossing. But if you, so this study tried to change people's behavior to get them to form the flossing habit, and they found that the people who flossed more frequently were the ones that kept that habit for longer periods of time. So frequency is number one. What does that mean for you as product designers, as entrepreneurs? If your product is not used frequently enough, and it turns out that that breaking point is about a week, that if your product isn't used in some way, shape, or form within the span of about a week's time, your chance of forming a habit drop precipitously. It's very difficult to change habits if the behavior doesn't occur within the span of at least a week's time. Now, some companies will have this problem, right, that their product isn't necessarily used frequently enough to change a habit. So there's a couple things you can do. One thing is to say, look, we can't form a habit. We're going to bring customers to our product a different way. Another thing is to figure out, look, it may not be that we need customers to check out 
it, and I'm using the parlance of, a, of, a, of an e-commerce site, right? That traditionally we want our customers to check out, to do the transaction and go away. How can we find ways to get them to check in? Not just check out, but check in. How can we get some kind of behavior that keeps them engaged in some way, shape, or form within the span of a week's time or less? And think about for, the, for a moment those companies we talked about earlier, the Pinterest and Instagram and Twitter. How often are those products used? Intraday, multiple times per day. Because of this frequency component, they had an easier time of forming a habit. Not impossible to do it if it's over a week's time, but becomes much more difficult. The second key component of changing a habit is attitude change. So this same study that, that uh, saw the flossing habit found that people who changed their perception of the behavior, they changed their attitudes in relationship to that behavior of flossing, were the ones who formed the habit. So the folks who went from, ah, I, don't brush my, I don't floss my teeth because that's what my dentist does for me every six months, that's his job, that went to believing, you know what, I can't go to sleep at night because I haven't flossed my teeth, it just feels weird, I have to do it. Those were the people who changed their attitudes, changed their, their perception of the behavior, and could maintain that habit. It became part of their day-to-day -day routine. Now, just so we're clear, the, the definition here, I should have expressed it earlier, the definition of a habit is very simple. It's a behavior done with little or no conscious thought. That's it, behavior done with little or no conscious thought. They can be good habits and bad habits. So we know habits can be good for our users. I'm obliged a little bit because I teach this course at the business school at Stanford to talk a little bit about the bottom line. Right? Why are habits so important for our companies? Well, it turns out there's a, a number of reasons. Number one, customer lifetime value, CLTV. That a customer who sticks around longer, who forms, who, who forms a bond with a product, who forms a habit with a product, the customer value to the company increases the longer that user stays with the product. And so habits help us hold on to our customers for longer periods of time. We have greater pricing flexibility. When customers form a dependency on a product, it becomes part of the routine. We have more flexibility with pricing. Supercharging growth. We want all our companies to grow virally. That viral growth is kind of something we all aspire to, but I think people don't consider how important viral cycle time is to viral growth. That in fact, just because your product is viral, just because one person tells more people about your product, that's not good enough. Let's get that clear. That is not good enough. Why? Because if that doesn't happen frequently enough, your, your, the, the retention of people in your product, using your product, will leak users out the bottom. It's called the leaky bucket business. So viral cycle time dictates that this process of users telling other users has to happen quickly and that users have to stay retained. So we have to have habits, we have to have high engagement products in order to see that hockey stick growth. Okay. Virality doesn't work with, with low, without low cycle time. Finally, habits increase defensibility. So when customers come to choose one product over another, they form habits with that product, it's very difficult for a competitor to come in and swoop those customers away. And if you want a great example of that, how many of you searched with Bing this morning or today? Anybody search with Bing today? How many of you searched with, Bing, with uh, Google today? Yeah, okay, there you go. Turns out in head-to-head -head comparisons, Bing is just as good as, as Google. Don't mean to burst anybody's bubble. Studies show time and again, the products are nearly identical, almost the same. When you strip away the branding, it turns out people really can't tell the difference in the results, almost identical. However, Google has become a habit. We don't even consider searching on Bing. We don't even consider if there might be a better solution out there because it's part of our day-to-day -day routine. It's just what we do. And if we tried to switch, all of a sudden the interface would look funny. It would look weird, right? Because we form this habit of using this particular product because of how defensible habits make certain products. With that said, creating habits is hard work. It's not easy to form user habits. It's not easy to change behavior. If you think about what habits technology-wise have changed in your life the past five years, maybe a handful or so that you could probably mention. They're exceptionally rare. Habits are, you know, if you think about those products, there aren't very many that in your life that have probably changed your day-to-day -day behavior. However, if your business model requires habits, requires what I call unprompted user engagement, users just taking out their, their, their phone, going to your website, using the product day in and day out without conscious thought, then what I'm going to do is to share with you a pattern to help you form 
better product hypotheses. So two points here. One, we should pause for a minute to say that not every business requires habits. Okay? What, what I teach, what I study, is not some kind of magical pixie dust that you can sprinkle on any product and poof, you get success. You may not need habits. And like I said, they're not easy to form. So if you can bring customers to your product with other means, advertising, search engine optimization, whatever it might be, that's great. There's no problem with that. If you can do that, do it. If you can make a profit doing that, fantastic. However, some products have to be habit forming. Facebook and Twitter and uh, Pinterest, these products couldn't exist if they had to rely on paid channels to bring users back. They require the formation of habits. So if your product is one of those type of products that requires habits to bring users back, this pattern that I'm about to share with you will help you form better hypotheses. Now what do I mean by better hypotheses? The purpose of, of my work, of the book, and this, of this presentation is to help you come up with a scheme for prioritizing what features you build into your product. Because what's the most expensive part of the Lean Startup methodology? Are you all familiar with Lean Startup methodology? Right? What are the three steps? Build, measure, measure learn. learn. Build, measure, learn. Those are the three steps of the Lean Startup methodology as espoused by Eric Ries and customer development with Steve Blank. Build, measure, learn. What's the most expensive part of Build, Measure, Learn? What? Yeah. Building, of course. Building is where the blood, sweat, and tears all go, right? Building is the hard part. Measuring and learning is easy. Once you have the process set up in place, that's the fun part. So if we can use consumer psychology to go a little deeper, to understand what should we build first, not what the boss says, right? Not what the highest paid person in the room thinks we should build, not even what our customers can articulate, right? Because many times customers can't articulate what they really want. But by looking into consumer psychology, by looking into what customers may not be, ar be able to articulate, but can still predict their behavior, we can increase our odds of success. We can build the right thing sooner. Saving time, saving money, saving heartache. Okay? That's what this is all about. Does this sound good? Are we in the right place? We excited? Okay, good. So this design pattern that I'm gonna share with you to help you build better product hypotheses is called the hook model. The hook model, very simply, is an experience designed to connect your user's problem with your solution with enough frequency to form a habit. Okay, connecting your user's problem with your solution with enough frequency to form a habit. Now it turns out that this hook model that we see time and time again, this pattern that we see in habit forming products has four steps. It starts with a trigger, an action, a reward, and an investment. And you can see there's kind of an infinite loop there. A quick acronym to remember is Atari. Did anybody have an Atari growing up? Okay, so a few folks from my generation, when I teach this class at Stanford, kids have no idea what the hell this is. So I'm glad at least some of you know what that is. It's an old gaming console, because I see some of you are like 20 years old here, which is great. Um, Atari is just an acronym I, I use for, a hook has four parts, a trigger, action, a reward, and investment. So when you go away from this one hour workshop, you'll hopefully remember Atari, so that you can make your own hooks. So let's start with the first step of the hook, the trigger. One thing that's crucial to know about behavior change and changing, changing customer behaviors and attitudes is that behaviors just aren't created. We can't will users to just do something because we've designed an awesome product to make them do it. We have to remember that habits are built upon. Okay? Does anybody know how a, a pearl is formed? How does a pearl get formed? A grain of sand is formed inside a Oyster? Yeah. yeah. Exactly, exactly. So an irritant, a grain of sand, something is in the oyster, and the oyster deposits layer upon layer of this patina called mother of pearl to encapsulate that irritant. So that if you were to cut inside a pearl, you would actually see it has rings, kind of like the rings of a tree. And it's a great metaphor for how we learn new behaviors. If you think about it, we come into this world with actually very few instinctual behaviors. And so to learn new things, we have to have a foundation to build upon. Right? We learn letters that help us decode words, that help us understand sentences, that help us read novels. So that foundation that we build new behaviors on top of are triggers. And these triggers come in two forms, external triggers and internal triggers. External triggers you're going to be very familiar with. External triggers are things that call us to action with explicit messages, right? So things that the information for what to do next is in the trigger itself. Click here, uh, buy now, 
a billboard, tweet this, things that tell you what to do where the information is in the trigger itself. A police officer directing you, word of mouth that your friend tells you this is a great thing to go do. Those are all examples of external triggers. Now, there's a whole field today that's becoming very popular around growth hacking, which is all about optimizing for external triggers. Growth hacking is a, is a great thing to learn, highly recommend you look into it. Not my area of expertise, but very, very important. I think designers and entrepreneurs know a lot about external triggers. We see them every day. What I think designers don't think about enough are internal triggers. Internal triggers are things that cue our behavior, that prompt our action just as reliably as an external trigger. However, the information for what to do next is formed through an association in the user's mind. So what we do when we're in certain places, around certain people, situations or routines, and most importantly at the top, emotions. So what we do in response to these internal triggers predictably dictates our next actions, just as reliably as those external triggers. And when it comes to emotions, it's not just emotions that trigger our next behavior. It's a particular type of emotion, and I'm referring to negative emotions. So what we do when we feel bored, lonesome, dissatisfied, anxious, lost, fearful, fatigued, how we react to these feelings dictates our next action, actually quite reliably. And some of the evidence that shows this is true is that we know that people with depression check email more. Now why would that be? Why would people with depression check email more? I gave this workshop a, a few weeks ago and somebody said, well that's obvious, it's because email is making us depressed. So that, that's one potential conclusion, but in fact, that's not what this study demonstrated. The study demonstrated that people with clinical depression experienced what psychologists call negative valence states. They felt down more frequently than the rest of the population. And so scientists could determine which people were likely suffering from cl clinical depression based on their use of the internet, based on how they used email. Because they were seeking to escape that negative state, feeling down by using this technology to boost their mood. And you think about it in your own life. What do people use when they're feeling lonely? What technology? What do we use? Facebook. Facebook, of course. What do we use when we're pretty much unsure about anything? We maybe could figure out the answer, but we'll just, what? Google, Google it, of course. And what about when we're feeling bored? Maybe two to four o'clock in the afternoon around this time of day when you really don't, need, you don't want to work on that big project. What do you do? Uh, this thing is not working so well, sorry. You go onto YouTube, right? YouTube, you check the news, check the stock price, the sports scores, lots of solutions to alleviate boredom. We don't like feeling these feelings. They don't feel good. Okay? So what do we do with this? So this is a little bit of you know, pop psychology, but how do we build products for it? Turns out it's critical to understand your user's internal trigger. What's the itch that you're building a product to scratch? Okay? Let's take a look at Instagram. Instagram did a lot of things well, a lot of things right. One of the things that I think they did really well was understand their users' triggers. So let's talk about external triggers for a moment. Who here uses Instagram, by the way? Anybody? Okay, good, a few folks. So Instagram's external triggers. So how did most people fi first find Instagram? What channels did, did they use? Facebook. Facebook, exactly. Facebook, Twitter, word of mouth, right? So you, you'd see somebody, somebody's post on Facebook from, from Instagram, and there'd be a call to action to come see my photo on Instagram. After you see that photo, maybe you'd install the app. So you'd have the app icon itself on your phone, which is an external trigger. And then you'd also start getting notifications that tell you, hey, your friend has just posted something to, uh, to Instagram. Come check it out. All examples of external triggers. Now, you said you use Instagram? Yeah. What's your name? Hemi. Hemi. Do you remember what the last thing you took a picture of, if it's suitable for work? Can you tell me? Yeah. Uh, a hike I did this weekend. Oh, great. So you went on a hike. You, you, Capture a picture of the landscape or something? Yeah. Okay, great. So I'm guessing the landscape didn't say, hey, Hemi, take a picture of me with Instagram, right? Landscapes, as far as I know, are inanimate objects. They can't talk to you. And yet, Hemi saw this beautiful landscape. He saw this moment in time, and he desired to capture it. The solution for the fear of losing the moment is Instagram. And instantly, the solution popped into his head. Instagram was a solution. Instagram wins. Right? They own that moment in his life. When you want to capture something, when you want to hold on to the moment, Instagram is a solution. Now, by the way, who else used to own the moment? 
Who else used to own the moment 30 years ago? Kodak. Kodak, the Kodak moment, right? And you all remember these commercials? That I'm, I'm guessing they had them here in Israel too, right? The, the puppy dog running through the grass, the, the children who would someday leave the empty nest, grandmother blowing out her maybe last birthday candles. You remember these ads, right? They were very schmaltzy. You remember these. Now, Instagram also formed associations with these moments in time. But Kodak spent billions of dollars and about 100 years teaching us the moment, right? They advertised to us to teach us this is the moment in your life where you should use Kodak, the Kodak moment. Instagram had its users teach other users what the Instagram moment is. Right? We did it for them. But of course, Instagram is much more than just a way to capture moments. That's just one internal trigger. That was kind of the pathway to use Instagram. Instagram also satiates other itches, right? Because Instagram is also a social network. So we use Instagram when we're feeling bored, when we are curious, when we're feeling a bit lonely. FOMO, does everybody know what FOMO is? Fear of missing out. It's actually in the Merriam-Webster's dictionary this year for the first time. FOMO, fear of missing out. Why? Because these things don't feel good, right? When we feel bored or curious or FOMO, these are negative valence states. We seek to escape those feelings. And the solution to that feeling is this product. Okay, make sense? Any questions so far? Triggers. Now it's time for the action, the thing that the, the trigger cues, the action that's cued. So act, the action phase is really about the simplest behavior in anticipation of reward. The simplest behavior in anticipation of reward. Let me show you how simple I mean by simple. And I want you to kind of think about it in your own mind as you're thinking about your product, how simple is your product compared to these actions? Something as simple as a scroll on Pinterest. A search on Google. The incredibly simple act of pushing the play button on YouTube. Simplest action in anticipation of reward. Now it turns out that there's actually a formula for individual behaviors, individual actions. And that formula comes to us from BJ Fogg, who's a researcher at Stanford. Uh, he runs the Persuasive Technology Lab. And Fogg posits that for any behavior to occur, any singular behavior to occur, that's B. We need three things at the same time. We need sufficient motivation. We need ability. Ability is how difficult or easy something is. And we need a trigger. We need motivation, ability, and a trigger at the same time. So we talked about triggers already. Let's dive into motivation and ability. Motivation, according to Edward D.C., who's the father of self-determination theory, is the energy for action, how much we want to do something. And psychologists have debated around the nature of human motivation forever. However, I think Fogg gives six levers, six factors of motivation that I think are simple enough to be useful in the startup context. He posits that all human beings seek pleasure and avoid pain. We seek hope and avoid fear. We seek social acceptance and we avoid social rejection. These are six levers that we can use in our product design to boost motivation. And the more we boost motivation, the more likely we are to see that behavior. So let me t let's take a pop quiz here. One industry that focuses on changing motivation is the ad business. So what I'm going to do is to show you some ads, and I want you to tell me what motivator is being used. Not, what, not what's being sold, but what motivator is being used. And the first one's going to be an easy one, a freebie. You ready? It's written across the bottom of the poster. But even without the word, what's the president looking towards? The future, exactly. Hope for the future. Here's another one. What's being sold is hamburgers. What's the motivator being used here? Let me get out of the way here. Pleasure, exactly, seeking pleasure. So who's the target demographic of these ads? Who are they targeting? Boys, boys, not even men, boys. Teenage boys. And for that audience, for teenage boys, sex is a very salient motivator associated with pleasure. Now for other demographics, for other people, this doesn't work at all. When I was a teenager, this was very cool. But now that I'm a, a father of a five-year-old little girl, it's not so cool anymore. That's someone's daughter too, <laughs> right? It doesn't work like it used to. And I'm sure there's other people, right, particularly women, that this doesn't appeal to at all. So it's very important to understand what our users' motivators are in order, in order for them to be effective. Here's another one. This is an advertisement for wearing a motorcycle helmet. 
It has a guy who has a very large scar on his head here, and it says, I won't wear a helmet. It makes me look stupid. It has his, his, his name and his mental age is two years old. What's the motivator? Fear. Fear, of course. Avoiding fear. Okay, here's one more. This is an ad for Budweiser beer. What's the motivator? Yeah, social acceptance. Exactly, social acceptance. I'm having a beer with my buds, right? Budweiser beer. So that's motivation, these six levers that we can pull to make a behavior more likely by boosting motivation. Let's talk about ability, the second part of B equals MAT. Ability is all about how easy a behavior is to do, the capacity to do a particular action. And here again, there are six levers, six things that we can pull to make a behavior more likely to occur based on these six factors. So how much time something takes, how much it costs, how much physical effort is involved, how many brain cycles, this is a big one, how difficult something is to understand directly affects how likely it is for the person to do it. And by the way, these aren't just online behaviors. Any be singular behavior in any of your products that you want the user to do will happen or will not happen based on how difficult it is to do on one of these six factors. Yeah. Social deviance, how different this behavior is from what people have seen other people do. And then finally, non-routine. Non-routine is the most important of the bunch when it comes to habits because it turns out that habits have a repeater effect. The more frequently we do a behavior, the more familiar it is to us, the more it becomes part of our routine, the more likely we are to do it because it becomes easier to do. What do we call that phenomenon? Practice, right? When we practice a behavior, it becomes easier to do. So Fogg puts together these three elements of a trigger, motivation, and ability onto this graph. And when any product you build, any behavior you want a user to do, you can use this model to understand why it might not be happening. Any behavior. Is the motivation high enough? Is the mo motivation, do we have sufficient motivation? Is the behavior easy enough to do? On this side of the graph, this is easy. On this side, it's difficult. And then finally, is there a trigger present? So let's make this very clear. Let's make this concrete. Think of the last time a telephone rang in your life, telephone rang in your life, and you did not pick up the phone. What's a reason you might not have picked it up? What? Busy. So maybe you're in this workshop right now, you see a call comes in, you, you hear it ring, and your motivation is very high. You actually really want to talk to that person, but it's too socially deviant to take a call in the middle of a, of a meeting or in a workshop. Your ability is too low. It's too hard at that moment. What's another reason? Didn't want to talk to the person. Great. So the phone rings. It's right next to you. Very easy to pick it up, but your motivation is too low. It didn't pass the threshold of the action occurring. What's one more reason that has to do with triggers? Silent. Silent. Perfect. Thank you. That's exactly right. Motivation was very high. You really wanted to pick up the call. Very easy to do, right? The phone was right next to you. No trigger was present. I can't tell you how many times I come into these fancy design reviews. I get hired to, to look at a product. And I say to myself, I say to the team, where's the trigger? What do you want me to do next? What do you want the user to do? So you have to have all three for any behavior to occur. Motivation, ability, and a trigger at the same time. And to increase the behavior, we want to focus on simplicity as a function of the scarcest resource. So we have to ask ourselves, what is the user missing? Right? What do they need more of? Are they deficient on time, money? Physical effort, is it too you know, physically difficult to do? Is it too outside their norm? Is it too non-routine? Is it too socially deviant? They haven't seen anybody like them doing it. Right? So we have to ask ourselves, what's, what does the user not have enough of at that moment? And this changes, by the way, by person and context. OK, let's do another quick case study here. Let's look at Twitter. Here's Twitter in 2009. Here's Twitter in 2010. And here's Twitter today. What do you see that's changed when it comes to motivation, ability, and triggers? What do you see that's different? Let's change. I'll do it again for you. 2009, 2010, 2014. Yeah, okay. A lot less text. A lot less text. So look, let's look at that for a second, okay? What is Twitter? What is a button? Why is a button? How is a button? Watch a video is a button. Click here is a button. Click there is a button. And get started and join is a button. 
Lots of triggers. What do you want the user to do? Look at what Twitter wants you to do today. Sign in or sign up or install the mobile app. That's really, it's all about signing in or signing up, right? Much clearer what you want the user to do. Now, many of you are thinking, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, but Twitter's in a different place. People needed more explanation in 2009 to understand what Twitter is for. Bullshit. This is where they hit their growth trajectory. When they changed to this model in mid-2010 is when they started to grow. When they moved from trying to explain what the product is and why customers should use it, and this big, long explanation that nobody freaking reads, when they moved to just getting people to do the action, sign in and see it for yourself, that's when the product went mainstream. That was a revelation for the company. So if your company is the kind, maybe I know you've all seen companies that have lots of text, a long video, lots of explanation to try and get people to try and boost their motivation to use their product, you may benefit by just getting people to do the behavior, making it easier by removing the extra. Right? Understand what the behavior is for each step of your flow, one key behavior, and make sure that behavior is as clear as possible to do. Increase the user's ability as much as possible. So that's action phase. So we figured out what triggers the user to use the product. The simplest action in anticipation of reward. Now it's time for the reward itself, scratching the user's itch. Do you have a question? Oh, OK. When we talk about rewards, we need to start in the brain. And in particular, an area of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. The nucleus accumbens was first studied by two researchers in Canada, Olds and Milner. And they did something very unusual. Well, they, they found a very unusual property of this part of the brain, the nucleus accumbens. What they found was that when they did experiments with lab animals, in this case, mice, and later people, they found that when they stimulated this part of the brain with a tiny electrical pulse, and they connected that pulse to a button that the lab animals and the people could actually stimulate for themselves, they wanted nothing else. All they wanted to do was to stimulate this very special part of the brain. Now, it turns out that you don't need an electrical shock to stimulate the nucleus accumbens. All of our brains are stimulated by things like a sale, certain, certain products that we desire. Junk food, nicotine, or the promise of nicotine, sex, and of course, in the middle, technology. All these things stimulate this part of the brain called the nucleus accumbens. So when Olds and Milner first discovered this area of the brain, they thought that they had discovered the brain's pleasure center. Why else would people incessantly click this part, or they click to self-stimulate this part of the brain if it wasn't because it felt good? Well, it turns out that wasn't exactly right. It turns out that what they had found wasn't pleasure, it was the stress of desire. The stress of desire. It turns out that the nucleus accumbens is actually stimulated in anticipation of reward and becomes quelled when the reward is received. And this is the study that proved it. People were put inside an fMRI machine, which measures, measures blood flow throughout the brain, and they were asked to gamble. They had a little gambling game that they played inside the machine. And what they found was that before they received the payout, when they were anticipating the reward that was about to come, that's when the nucleus accumbens became active. When the thing that was supposed to make them feel good was actually received, it quelled. That area of the brain became less active and other areas were activated. So this nucleus accumbens is all about anticipation, about wanting, about craving, about desire. It's about the itch. That itch that I stimulated in many of you at the beginning of the talk when I asked you to imagine your email. That craving, that wanting, the desire, the stress, the anxiety, that was all part of the itch. Anticipation. Now, it turns out that there's a way to supercharge this, that stress of desire, that wanting. Does anybody want to know how? Is anybody curious? Yeah? Exactly. The unknown is fascinating. So when I took that long pause and I asked you a question, I asked you if you wanted to know the answer, some of you perked up, right? Some of you kind of paid more attention. The unknown variability turns out is very engaging. Okay? We, it increases our focus, it increases our engagement, and it turns out to be highly habit-forming. 
Some of the research that you may remember if you took a psychology course in college is the work of B.F. Skinner. B.F. Skinner put pigeons inside a box. He gave them a lever to dispense a reward, in his case, a food pellet. And he found that when those pigeons clicked on the lever at first, they would receive a regular reward, right? You click the lever, receive a food pellet. Click the lever, receive a food pellet. And so they basically ate when they were hungry. However, when Skinner did something a little different, when he added a bit of variability, what's called an intermittent reward. So the pigeon would click the lever, and a, a food pellet would come out. But the pigeon would click the lever again, and nothing would come out. And when he introduced some variability, the rate of response, the number of times the pigeon clicked, increased. The action was observed to happen more frequently. Why? Because variability spikes the neurotransmitter dopamine, which activates the nucleus accumbens. It creates this desire, it creates the stress of wanting when we see variability, when we see mystery, when there's an element of the unknown. And it turns out that there are three main types of variability, according to me, according to my theory. There's three main kinds of variability that we see in all sorts of products. And I hope that when you leave here today, you'll start looking at the world around you and start asking yourself, why are the things that you like to do and why other people like to do these particular behaviors and use certain products, where's the variability? What's the element of mystery? And you'll find that products that most engage us, that create habits and even addictions, have some element of variability. One or more of these types. Rewards of the tribe, rewards of the hunt, or rewards of the self. So let's go through these. First is the search for social rewards, what I call rewards of the tribe. So things that feel good, that have an element of variability, that come from other people. So things like, empath Jeez. Things like empathetic joy, feeling good because of others' joy. Cooperation, competition, sex, all these things have an element of mystery, feel good, and come from other people. Now think about this in a technology setting. On social networking, for example, right? Social media has an element, a high degree of variability. Mark Zuckerberg gets married and 1.3 million people like it. Think about all the variability that's involved with social media. What are people gonna post? How many people are gonna like it? What are the comments gonna be? Large degree of variability associated with social media. Spectator sports, think about all the things that we do in, in the context of spectator sports that are unique to that experience, right? We dress up in tribal colors, we scream like crazy, we pay too much for beer and hot, and hot dogs and pretzels, all in the context of this variable reward of the tribe. How many of you use Stack Overflow? I'm sure the engineers do, right? Stack Overflow, for those of you who aren't familiar, is the world's largest technical question and answer site. 5,000 questions get answered every single day on this site. Now, these are not easily Googleable answers. These are highly technical, sophisticated questions that require lengthy explanations. And for many people, it's kind of crazy that people do this, right? This is technical documentation. It's kind of boring stuff. And yet, 5,000 questions per day get answered voluntarily. Why? What's going on? Well, what happens when you post an answer to Stack Overflow? What happens to your question? Exactly, upvoted or downvoted. Right? And those upvotes turn into points, and those points turn into badges. And those badges, those aren't just for decorating your profile, right? Nobody cares about what they look like. They denote social status. They denote how valuable you are to your tribe, the community of people whose opinions you care about, fellow engineers. It's a variable reward of the tribe. Next is the search for resources, what I call rewards of the hunt. So the search for resources stems from our primal need to find food and resources. And of course, in modern society, food is translated into money. So when people think of variable rewards, they often think of Las Vegas, they think of slot machines, where the primary reward payout is money, right? It's currency. This also occurs in shopping, right? When we think about the hunt for the next deal, the next sale, it's about variability. It's this mystery of what am I going to find if I go shopping today? Large degree of variability. Think about information rewards. Right? Why is it that the feed has become so popular today? Why do we see the feed in so many products? Right? Instagram used to ha didn't used to have one, now it does. The feed is in everything. Why? Well, let's think about it for a minute. Okay, that's not interesting, that's not interesting, but oh, that's interesting. And to get more of that reward, what do I have to do? Just keep flicking. So this becomes very similar 
to this. Okay? Both variable rewards of the hunt. If you want to see the masters of this, take a look at Pinterest. I dare you to go to Pinterest.com and not scroll one time. Very hard not to do. Why? Because it's this never-ending wall of interesting objects curated by other people because they're fascinating, because they're interesting, and they're variable. I actually got this little comic from a pin board called Pinterest Addicts, where it has this little guy, for those of you who can't see back there, a little guy scrolled over, I mean, uh, hunched over his computer, and it says, scroll, 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 and then he says, ha, 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 and then scroll, 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 scroll. That's the process, searching and searching and never done searching. Okay. Finally is the search for self-achievement, what I call rewards of the self. Now, rewards of the self are about things that have a, an element of variability, there's an element of mystery, that feel good, but don't come from other people, and aren't about material or information rewards. So the best example of this is gameplay. When we play games by ourselves, it's about the search for mastery, consistency, control, achievement. Right? And if you say to yourself, well, I'm not much of a game player, I don't really understand that, I bet you you play this game every day. Right? Checking your email, clearing a notification, finishing your to-do list for the day. All this is about the endless hunt, the endless search for rewards of the self. Completion, mastery, consistency, and control. Now, some words of warning. Before yourself, you say to yourself, great, we'll just put all kinds of variable rewards inside our product, let me give you one big word of warning. That variable rewards are not a free pass. Variable rewards are not a free pass. Everybody heard about gamification? Right, we've heard about gamification. Gamification is not necessarily a bad thing. I think it can work in the right context. However, where gamification goes wrong is when it's not meaningful, when it's plopped on after the fact, when it takes something that people don't really want to do and tries to add these meaningless rewards on top of it. So the reward has to match the itch it's addressing. Okay? If your product is going after the internal trigger, the itch of boredom, well, the variable reward has to provide entertainment. Okay? If it's uncertainty, then is the itch, then there has to be some sense of security that you're providing in the reward. So they have to match. You can't just plop on variable rewards. It has to scratch the user's itch. The whole goal of the variable reward phase is to scratch the user's itch, to give them what they came for, and yet leave them wanting more. Give them the promise that there'll be something interesting the next time they come to use the product. Finally, the investment phase. So we've figured out the user's triggers, we've formulated the simplest action in anticipation of reward, we've given them what they've came for, come for and yet leave them wanting more, and then finally, the investment phase. Now the investment phase is my favorite part of the hook because I think it's the one that people consider the least. Many products just have these, the first three steps, right? A cue, a trigger, uh, an action, and a reward, a feedback loop. However, if you're not asking users to invest, you're gonna have a tough time building a habit. Let me show you why. The investment phase is all about asking the user to do a bit of work, a small piece of work that makes the service better over time, that makes it more likely that the user will go through the steps of the hook in the future. It's about increasing the likelihood of the next pass through the hook. It's where the user puts something of value into the system in the form of time, money, social capital, data, something into the system which increases the likelihood of the next pass. So there are two ways this happens. Two ways to increase the likelihood of the next pass. First is loading the next trigger. So products that ask users to do a small investment, to take a small action, which increases the likelihood of the next pass by loading the next trigger, have an easier time forming user habits. Let me show you an example. So on WhatsApp, right? when you open WhatsApp, you're opening it in anticipation of reward. What's gonna be there, right? That's the action phase, open the app. Now what happens when you invest? How do you invest in WhatsApp? Well, when you write someone a message, you don't get a point, right? You don't get a badge. Right? When you write someone a message, it's about the anticipation of a future reward. And when you do that, you're loading the next trigger. Why? Because when you send someone a message, you're, about, you're going to soon get, probably, unless they don't write back, if they write back, you're going to get an external trigger, which brings you back to the app. Right? You've loaded the next trigger. Pinterest. When you install the Pinterest pin it button on your Chrome, 
you're loading the next trigger. Every time you see something on the web that you want to keep, that you want to save, that you have a fear of losing, Pinterest is the solution. And the trigger is right there to remind you. Now, what's the old habit that Pinterest replaced? Bookmarking. Bookmarking, of course. Anybody knows how freakishly close the pin it button is to the bookmarking button? That's the habit. That's the moment that they want to capture for themselves, right? There's no coincidence that their button is right next to where the old habit used to be. Let's take a look a little deeper at, at Pinterest. Here's the full Pinterest hook. Pinterest actually has two hooks. The first step of their hook is the external trigger. So most people, when they first come to use uh, Pinterest, they're brought there from Facebook or Twitter or through word of mouth. The action is to simply scroll, just scrolling through Pinterest. Look how easy of an action. When you scroll, you get the reward. And the reward here is about searching for interesting objects, right? Rewards of the hunt, searching for these objects. Now, before you've, you've signed up, this is where you would do it. Right? You would register for the site, you would authenticate with Facebook, you'd start pinning, repinning, and following. And when you do that, you're loading the next trigger. You're giving the company the opportunity to send you a message, to send you a notification that says, hey, come back to Pinterest. Something that you did has changed, right? Come find out what happened. So here's what happens next. You get an external trigger, that, an email or notification that says, hey, one of your friends, Jenny, we know that it's your friend because you authenticated with Facebook. Your friend just did something on, on Pinterest. Come check it out. The action is just to log in. The simple action of pushing the button and going to the site. Now look at the variable rewards. It's no longer just about interesting objects. It's not just about the hunt. It's also about the tribe. What did my friend Jenny post? Right? What did people say about it? There's a lot more variability here because now it's about a communication medium with my friends. It's about the tribe. And then finally, installing the pin it button, pinning again, repinning, following, comment, all these things load the next trigger. Now, not only do these things load the next trigger, these investments, bringing the user back again, they also do something that is the second way that investments increase the likelihood of the next pass. And that's by storing value. There's a very interesting property about technology that, I, that is one of the main reasons I like working in this field so much is because unlike physical products, right? unlike things made out of atoms, these things depreciate. They lose value over time. Okay? So the chairs you're sitting on, your phones, your computers, all these things lose value with time. Habit-forming technology has a different property. Habit-forming technology should appreciate with value. It should get better with use. And it does that through this property of stored value. By storing content, when you put music into iTunes, the more content you put into iTunes, the, more, the better it becomes. The more it becomes your single online music library. Data, when you use mint.com, Right, personal finance software, or Pinterest for that matter. The more data you give the service, the more customized your experience becomes. Right, if you logged into my Facebook account, or my Twitter account, or my Pinterest account, it wouldn't actually be all that interesting to you. Because it's been tailored to use, to my use, based on my data. And the more data I give it, the better it becomes for me. Making it more likely that I'll continue the hook cycle in the future. Followers. The more followers I have, the more stored value there is in the product. Okay. Who's, if, if Twitter sent out an email yesterday and said, we're, send, we're shutting off Twitter unless you give us money, who's going to give more money? Somebody with a lot of followers or very few followers? Right? Of course, the person who has a lot of followers. Because the more followers you have, the better it becomes as a method for reaching your audience. It stores value. Finally, reputation. So reputation is a form of stored value that users can literally take to the bank. So my reputation on eBay or TaskRabbit or Airbnb literally can be monetized because I can make more money based on my reputation score. It's a form of stored value. And how likely am I to leave to go to a competing service if I've already built up this reputation on one of these companies? So these investments create preference. By putting in small bits of work, it does the second goal that we, that we spoke about at the very beginning around, remember, frequency and changing our perception of the behavior. So by investing in these products, by these tiny actions, we literally change the way we perceive that behavior, how we perceive that product. Let me skip ahead here. 
So here's what you can remember. Remember the hook model is these four steps of a trigger, action, reward, and investment. These are experiences designed to connect the user's problem with your solution with enough frequency to form a habit. And through these successive cycles, by running users through these four steps, we form associations, we create preferences, and we change attitudes about the product. So remember Atari, a trigger, action, reward, and investment, and that you can use these five questions to ask yourself the habit-forming potential of your product. And as you're designing new features, as you're trying to come up with what should we build next if your product is a habit-forming product, what internal trigger is your product addressing? What's the itch? What external trigger gets the user to the product? Number three, what's the simplest behavior done in anticipation of reward? Number four, is the reward fulfilling and yet leaves the user wanting more? And then finally, what's the bit of work done to increase the likelihood of the user returning next time? So that's the basics of the hook. There's a lot more in the book, by the way. I know that was very fast, a lot of information. But before I leave, I want to talk for a minute about the morality of manipulation. That some of you might have had kind of a queasy feeling as I gave this presentation about, you know, is this ethical? Is this okay to do? Should we change people's day-to-day -day behaviors in this way? And let me be very honest with you. Design is manipulation. Right? We're shaping the user's path to get them to take the actions we want them to take. And we need to be very careful about what we design for people. We have a very special responsibility. Because we're living in an age where designers, where entrepreneurs, have more power to influence human behavior than ever before. Our technologies are the ones that people take with them to bed. Our devices, our applications are the ones that people check first thing in the morning, before they even kiss their spouses in the morning. And as Ian Bogo said, technology may be the cigarette of this century. So designers have a very special responsibility on what you choose to work on, and you always have a choice. One thing that we have no shortage of in this world is problems to fix. There's a huge supply of problems to fix. And so I encourage you, with the tremendous power that you have, as an entrepreneur, as a product builder, to find something to work on that's meaningful, that's important, that can improve people's lives, and use these principles of building user habits, not just for nefarious time-wasting purposes, but do something good. Help people live healthier, more fulfilling, happier, richer lives using habit-forming technology. And to borrow from the words of Gandhi, I encourage you to build the change that you wish to see in the world. Thank you very much. And, and finally, before I go, if you uh, invite you to take out your phones or your laptops, anything that's connected, if you go to opinion2.us, uh, I've got a very, very short survey for you, just five questions. I'd love to hear what you liked, what you didn't like, very, very quick. And as soon as you do that and click submit, you can get all these slides. You can be taken to my slide share page. And you, if you want these slides, they're yours to keep and share. Thank you. <laughs>